question for today is really twofold. What is the solution to life's inequities? And can prosperity bring fulfillment? In yesterday's class, we concluded by taking a look at that aspect of time, the aspect that bothered Solomon so much. And we saw that he concluded that man has no control over his own life. The best thing that he can do is respond in wisdom to the events that are brought into his life. And that without God, mankind is really no different than the animals. But time has been brought into man's life for a very specific reason, to teach us the fear of God, to teach us to revere him, and to have humility as we approach our service before him. And so we saw the exhortation for each one of us that we need to use the time now to prepare for the future, to look forward to the day of when things will not be as they are today. And so a consideration of time has led Solomon to the sobering realization that this life is designed to frustrate man. Not for frustration's sake alone, but so that man might be led to look for something better beyond his current state. And so instead of fighting against time, instead of wishing that our lives were different, Solomon says, embrace God's mechanism that he's using to prepare you for something better. But these were Solomon's thoughts. These were his conclusions. And what we find Solomon doing from chapter 3 as we move forward into today's material in chapters 4 through 6 is now going to see where this is practically demonstrated in real life. Maybe he was thinking too deeply about this. Maybe these were just his conclusions. Or maybe not. So he would go to see, is this something that I observe in reality? So we see these transitional words. So I returned again and considered. Again I considered in 4 and verse 4. Then I returned and I saw in 4 and verse 7. I considered in 4 and verse 15. I have seen 5 verse 13, 18, 6 and verse 1. Seeing there be many things in 6 and verse 11. Solomon's now going out to observe what he can see in real life. Will human experience justify his conclusions or say something different? And this is very much in keeping with the methodology that Solomon described in chapter 1 and verse 13 where he said that he was going to seek and search out. Seeking means to tread or to thresh. So he's treading all these different pathways in life. He starts at a central node and goes down one pathway. He finds that this leads to a dead end. But in the process of getting to that dead end, he's treading it out. He's threshing all the information that he's getting, collecting all the data, and he's distilling it down into two buckets, a bucket of good and a bucket of evil. What is better and what has no profit? And so by the end of his study, by the end of his analysis, he has two buckets. And it's interesting at the end of the study to pour them out to see what's contained within them. But this is what Solomon's doing. Treading, threshing, and exploring. And we're going to find that he draws some significant conclusions from this. The two pathways that we're going to take a look at today, Lord willing, are the pathways that are outlined here on this next screen. The inequities of life and the better alternative. That's in chapter 4, verse 1, to chapter 5, verse 9. Solomon talks about a lot of different aspects of this life. And he says, well, what's the better alternative in each case to each of those dead ends that you experience when you consider the unfairness or the inequities of this life? What's the solution? And he also takes a look at the pursuit of prosperity and the better pursuit than that of prosperity in chapter 5, verse 10, to chapter 6 and verse 12. So starting at the top then, he considers these aspects, of the inequities in life. He considers oppression, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. In verses 4 through 6, he considers success and envy. In verses 7 through 12, self-serving toil. Power and popularity in verses 13 to 16. And then he says, here's the solution, living with God, in chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. He then goes on and says, well... What if you just had a little bit more? What if you had a little bit more? Would that make things a lot better? And so he considers this pursuit of prosperity and the detriments that are associated with it. And he says that the solution to that in chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, is godliness with contentment. But despite that conclusion, there's a common pathway that men go down at the beginning of chapter 6. And he concludes chapter 6 by reflecting on the first half of the book and drawing some conclusions, and asking that question, well, what is good for man? Who knows what is good for man? 
So let's begin then by taking a look at this aspect of oppression. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Solomon looks at the individual who has no advocate and is oppressed by those in power. No advocate and no hope for any kind of improvement in this life. They have no hope beyond this life because they don't see the sun. They're just living under the toil and the affliction of this present age. This would have been particularly hard for Solomon to observe because Solomon was the one who was in power. He was in a position of being able to provide justice. But he saw this continuing in his kingdom. And he said, for that individual who has no hope of anything better than oppression, it's better for them that they never be born than to have to experience the evils under the sun. Solomon starts at the very bottom, the very bottom of humanity, those people that are oppressed with no hope of anything better. But what about those who aren't oppressed? What about those who experience some success in this life? So he goes on to consider that individual in verses 4 through 6, because if you're successful, then you're not really in a position of being oppressed anymore. You're the one that's kind of rising up. And so he looks at that individual and he says, yes, you can enjoy success at least, well, at least until somebody else sees that you're successful. Because they envy that success. Why did this guy get that? That's not fair. You don't deserve that. How many people have experienced that in their life of where something good happens? It's shared with somebody else because you think, well, they're going to be happy about it. And in reality, they're not happy. They end up envying something good that's happened. So Solomon says, well, what if we contrast then the super successful with the lazy fool? So there's this lazy, indolent fool that he begins to speak about in verse 5. The fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh. So in contrast to the super successful, you have the fool who does nothing. And he destroys himself by sitting around and doing nothing. Destroys his own flesh because he doesn't work and he has nothing to eat. Solomon says there is a better alternative. The better alternative is in verse 6. Instead of having two hands full, instead of being super successful, have one hand full and be able to enjoy that with peace. Solomon says that moderation is the best course of action. But this isn't the prevailing thought of our time, is it, brothers and sisters? The thought is that more success brings more happiness. Solomon says that's not the case. But then he goes on to consider in verses 7 through 12, self-serving toil. Okay, if you're successful, that success is ruined by the envy of other people. But what if you cut out everybody else? Anybody who could possibly bring envy into your life or take away from your sense of fulfillment, what if you get rid of them? And so that's what he talks about here in verse 8. There's one that's alone. There's not a second. He hath neither child nor brother. This person has made a conscious decision to cut off all of their family, to cut off all of their relations because they want to pursue single-mindedly their own personal success. And they're rich. They're filthy rich. They're rising to the top. But he never stops to ask the question, why do I want to be at the top? He's not satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. Never stops to ask the question, why am I making all these sacrifices? And he never even enjoys what he has because he's always looking to what he wants next. And we look at this individual and we say, this is ridiculous. This type of person doesn't exist. Solomon is painting this extreme example to point out something very specific to you and I, brothers and sisters. How many times have we seen marriages suffer and families suffer because somebody pursues their own personal success, a goal that they personally have in this life, and you see families dissolve because somebody's pursuing something now. Nobody says, I want a broken family. Nobody says, I, I want a broken marriage or I want my kids to leave the truth. But Solomon's saying we have to ask the questions, why? We have to ask the questions, why? That's the key is asking the question, why am I doing what I'm, what I'm doing? Where am I going? What do I hope to achieve? Why do I envy what other people have? Why am I not content with what God's given me? 
That's what Solomon's saying here in verses 7 through 12. So he says, what's the better alternative? Well, the better alternative is in verse 9. Companionship is the better alternative. Companionship is the better alternative to solely pursuing prosperity in this life. But to the man of verse 8, companionship, well, that's a hindrance to getting done what he wants to get done. Because if I'm spending time on other people and sorting out their issues, well, that means I have less time to spend on my own issues. We don't think like that, do we? Well, of course, maybe we don't consciously think like that. But do our actions reveal otherwise? Of where we get so busy with what we have going on that we're not aware of what's going on in the lives of other people. Solomon says, even though it seems like you're going to get less done by focusing and helping other people, the opposite is actually true. You will become more effective by pursuing companionship and looking out for other people. But it takes effort, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? This is something that has to be deliberate. He who wants friends must show himself friendly. It's not something that happens by accident to have good relationships, to have strong families, to have strong connections with our brothers and sisters. And Solomon says that those two working together, that the results of their labor is greater than those two individual components if they were working by themselves. Because when one falls, the other can help him. When one stumbles, the other can stabilize. If you're on your own, there's no stabilization. There's no help when you fall. Solomon's trying to get them to think about this fact because there's never going to be a time when you're always up here. You're not always going to be the strong person. You're going to need help sometimes. And you want to make sure that other people are there when you need that help. If two are withstood, Perhaps they, can, perhaps they can stand against this, is what he says in verse 12. If one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Pursue companionship instead of solitary success. It's just a redirection of that effort. Instead of just pursuing what we want, we pursue the combined success of our brothers and sisters, of our families, and of our children. So now Solomon moves on. And he says, okay, well, I've looked at oppression. I've looked at the need for moderation. I've looked at the need for companionship. But is there something else that trumps it all to where I don't really have to apply all that effort in perhaps other areas that I'd rather not apply them? What about power and popularity? Is that solution to everything? Because if I have power, I don't need to worry about oppression. I'm not the one being oppressed because I have power. I have this position. And if I have popularity, well, then perhaps that replaces the need for companionship because now I'm held in awe by everyone around me. Well, Solomon begins this section by saying not so. And he starts by speaking about what's better. He says, poor is a, or better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no longer be admonished. And this one hit very close to home for Solomon. Because who was it that took over his kingdom, that wrested the kingdom away from Rehoboam? Wasn't it the son of a widow, a poor and wise child, Jeroboam, who conducted himself wisely in all the matters that he did before King Solomon? The old and foolish King Solomon would no longer be admonished by God, was fighting against God when God brought adversaries into his life. But this poor and wise child gain the position of power, gain the popularity of the people. And Solomon says that the popularity of the multitude is fickle. It goes away. And the thought that power brings stabilization was just an illusion. It could vanish at any time. It's better to be poor and wise than rich and foolish. And so observation has led him to a similar conclusion to what it is that he's found from his own experience, from his own conclusions and postulations on the matter. And so if you were to summarize this section, here's what you'd see. Different aspects that Solomon's considered, the evil or vanity associated with that aspect, the better alternative, and the lesson for us that he wants us to take away. With the aspect of oppression, the evil or the vanity is the injustice with no relief, no hope of anything better. 
Solomon says if that's all that you have, it's better to never have been born. A life of oppression without hope, without God, is worthless. He then went on to consider success and envy, of where the joy of success is spoiled by envy. He says moderation with peace is the better alternative. More is not always better. Enough is best, is what Solomon tells us. Self-serving toil, of where we sacrifice our family, where we sacrifice things that are really important, to go after things that are fleeting and that don't last. Solomon says the better alternative is companionship with self-sacrifice, because lust can be fed but never filled. Pursue the good of others for true fulfillment. And finally, he goes and considers power and popularity. That power and popularity are fleeting and that they pass away. It's better to pursue wisdom and humility because man's estimation is transient. But wisdom with humility exceeds all. Living with God is the ultimate solution to life's inequities. Solomon's gone down many pathways. He's explored many different avenues and they've all come to the same conclusion. There's no solution in this life. But in each case, he's been able to identify the better alternative. And I took this chart and I put it into my Bible because I found it to be helpful to summarize what it is that Solomon wants us to take away. But throughout the course of reading this, we can think, oh, there's no hope. There's nothing that, nothing can, that can be achieved. And we feel this sense of despair. But I think that Solomon realizes as we're reading this where he's bringing us to. He sees that he's brought the reader to the feeling of despair, to the edge of the cliff, and he says, wait a minute, let me tell you about what's better. Seeing that everything else in life is going nowhere, this is what I want you to take away from it. And at the beginning of chapter 5, this is the first occurrence now in the book of where Solomon reaches through the page and says, you, this is what I want you to understand from what I'm telling you. We see a repetition of this 17 times in the first nine verses of where he changes the pronouns. It's worth coloring them in because each time that this happens in the book, there's a very specific message that Solomon's trying to get them to take away. I say them, but it's really us. This is where he's speaking to those in the ecclesia, to us, brothers and sisters. There's six times in Ecclesiastes where he does this, and this is the first occurrence. In this case, the backdrop is the inequities of this life. He showed in chapter 3 in the consideration of time that God is working to save man. God is actually working to save us from ourselves. And now here in chapter 5, he's saying this is what your attitude needs to be in response to God working with you. And he gives us three actionable pursuits that he wants us to move forward with. Sincerity in worship in verse 1. Obedience is better than sacrifice. It's better to do the right thing than to be sorry for doing the wrong thing. He talks about sincerity in prayer in verses 2 and 3. Revering God in humility. Having the right attitude when we come before our Heavenly Father. And he talks about sincerity in vows. Keeping the promises that we make in verses 4 through 7. Avoiding hypocrisy. And in each one of these cases, each one of these actionable pursuits, he tells us what action is required. And he tells us the result of that action if we execute it successfully. So in the first one, for sincerity and worship, he tells us in chapter 5 and verse 1 to keep your foot. Keep your foot when you go to the house of God. Keeping your foot is shamar. It means to guard. Guard your foot. Pay attention to what you're doing. Worship God with purpose. Don't just go through the motions. Don't be empty in the way that you serve God. It's not enough to just physically be there. Pay attention to what you're doing. And he says to be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. That word here is Shema, which means to hear intelligently. It means to be obedient, as it's used in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 22. The result of doing this, of being purposeful in our worship, of knowing what we're doing when we're doing it, not just going through the motions and being obedient, is that we avoid self-deception and abominable worship. 
He then goes in to talk about sincerity in prayer. And he says, when you go to pray, every word that you say has to be carefully measured. Remember, God is in heaven. You are on earth, and God has condescended to listen to what you have to say. Make sure that you keep that humility in heart and that you pay attention to what you're saying. Don't just say things without thinking. Pay attention. And the result is that we offer meaningful prayer that's accepted by God. There's a quote from our brother L.G. Sargent that says, True prayer is not a rush of words or a flush of feeling. Like sacrifice, it is the product of a dedicated life held in awe of the divine majesty. Prayer is not just something that sounds nice. Prayer is the result of a lifestyle that's dedicated to God. Prayer is the result of that lifestyle. It has to be founded on sincerity and humility. He then goes on to talk about sincerity and vows. He says, keep the promises that you make to God in verse 4. There's no wiggle room here. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Give God the first and the best. What did Abraham do? He rose up early when there was something to be done. He gave God the first and the best. Think about what you say before you say it in verse 5. It's better that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. That doesn't mean that we don't make a commitment. It means that you think before you make the commitment. You pay attention to what you're doing, and once you've made that commitment, you give God the first and the best. And we have to avoid making excuses for not doing what needs to be done. Look at what he says in verse 6. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. What's he mean before the angel? Where are the angels? Well, the angels, they're the eyes of the Lord that roam to and fro throughout the whole earth. He said, pay attention. When you make an excuse, the angels are hearing the excuse that you're making. Don't say excuses before the angels for not doing what needs to be done. What did Joseph say when Potiphar's wife came to him? How can I do this great evil? How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He couldn't see God, but God could see him. And that's the same thing for each one of us. And the result is that God will have purpose with us. Look what he says about the fool in verse 4. He hath no pleasure in fools. That word pleasure means purpose. God does not have a purpose with fools. God does not save people just to save people. God saves people who are purposeful for him, who are useful vessels for manifesting his name. And it allows us to have purpose. That's very important when God's looking for those who will be his in the kingdom. God will not destroy us in his anger is what he says at the end of verse 6. Solomon's talking about sincerity in our approach to God versus insincerity. And he says, these are the three actionable pursuits, but I want you to understand what the root of insincere worship is. I want you to understand what's at the very core of it. And you can take a look and see this to be the case in verse 3. He says, dreams come through a multitude of business in verse 3. We've got a lot of things going on in our minds throughout the day. We're bombarded with all the things going on. Your mind can't sort it all out, so you go to bed at night. And, you're dream and you start dreaming. Your mind's trying to defrag and put it all into the right order. Because you can't make sense of it. But he continues this thought in verse 7. And he says, well, a multitude of dreams leads to vanity. So if a dream comes from a multitude of business, what about a multitude of dreams? Well, that must come from a superabundance of business. Way too much activity going on. And Solomon's telling us that the root cause of insincere worship is too much business. Too much going on in our lives of where we heap all of these things into our lives. And when we come before God, we're insincere in our worship. We're physically here, but our minds are somewhere else. Our minds are off thinking about all the other things of the day that have been going on. And this is a major, major conclusion that Solomon's bringing before us. He says everything else is vanity in life. Everything else is going nowhere. But please, please make sure that when you approach God, that that is not also vanity. 
Don't let your worship to God become vanity. That's what everything else in this life is. God's not interested in you physically. Where you're at physically, we think that we're doing well when we come somewhere physically and we sit down to do the readings or to hear a class. God wants your mind, is what Solomon's saying. Make sure that you give him your mind, is what he's telling us. And he outlines this with a wise person and a foolish person. So let's summarize what the wise does versus what the foolish does. The wise person, their heart is in it. They're sincere in their worship. They're purposeful and they're obedient before their heavenly father. They think about what they're doing and they carry through in obedience. The wise is also sincere in their prayer. They're reflective. They think about what they're saying. They realize their position before God as they humbly approach before him and they offer meaningful prayer. And they're sincere in their vows. They live it. They keep the promises. They give God the first and the best. And they're aware that God is everywhere present, seeing what they do in their lives. And so if you were to distill this down to three phrases, the wise purposes and acts in obedience. The wise reflects and reveres God in humility. And the wise promises and keeps in sincerity. Sincerity in worship, sincerity in prayers, and sincerity in vows. This is living with God. And Solomon's saying this is the best that you can do. This is the solution. I'm going to switch to the next slide. I'm getting the, the one moment sign. I'm going to have to keep going, though, and I, we can bring this up later. But the foolish, on the other hand, the foolish are not sincere. Their heart's not in it. Instead, they offer empty sacrifice. They're self-deceived. They think that they're doing a good job. But in reality, their heart is somewhere else. They don't revere God. They're quick to speak, and when they sit down to pray, they offer jumbled prayer because there's so much going on in their minds. And I know how difficult it is, brothers and sisters, to offer meaningful prayer. But we have to do that if we're going to be sincere in our worship. And the fool doesn't live it. They break the promises. They make excuses for not keeping what they said they were going to keep. And so the fool acts, but never reflects. The fool knows God, but doesn't revere him. And the fool speaks much, but accomplishes little. The issue with Solomon's fool is not one of intellectual disadvantage. He's not stupid. Solomon's fool is actually quite intelligent. But the problem with the fool of Solomon is that he's preoccupied with this life. He's entangled with the affairs of this life. A multitude of business is what occupies this individual. He's living under the sun. And Solomon's telling us, living under the sun isn't just something that applies to people out there. It can affect those within the house of faith as well. So make sure, make sure that you're sincere because Solomon's calling each one of us out on the carpet here. And he's saying, this is what I'm saying to you. I've been telling you all about my conclusions, but here's what it means to you. And it's very difficult as we go through life to make sure that we really keep those promises because this is something that we do on a daily basis of where we get home and we can make excuses, excuses that satisfy us of where I know that something needs to be done, but I'm, I'm really too tired today. My brain's fried or I know that there's something that I need to be committing to, that there's something in the ecclesia that's languishing. But, you know, I have this issue going on at work or this this other thing that I'm working on. And as soon as I get that done, well, then I can pay attention to that thing that's languishing. There's a quote that says there's two types of people. People who get things done and people who have excuses for why they didn't. The angels hear the excuses that we make. And even though it may pacify us, it doesn't pacify the angels that report back to our Heavenly Father. Solomon's giving us this reminder here that God is everywhere present. And we think that we can get ahead just a little bit 
by putting off things that relate to God, just giving a little bit more time to something that we think is important and maybe robbing God just a little bit. But it's that analogy of putting money into a bag with holes. If we're, we're putting money in there thinking we're getting ahead but not realizing it's, it's coming out the bottom at a rate faster than we can put it in. We're never going to fix life's inequities. So we're better off not becoming entangled with the things of this life. So is this the solution? Well, it is long term. But Solomon says short term, you're still going to have to struggle. Even though I'm giving you this advice of what you need to do, short term, you're still going to struggle in verse 8. If thou seest the oppression of the poor and the violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter, because he that is higher than the highest regardest. It's not going to prevent you from having to deal with hardship. It's not going to fix all the problems with humanity, but long term it provides a solution. Long term it will result in a solution. But don't be surprised when you continue to see these things. Because in verse 9, even the land is put under tribute. Even the land is taxed. And if God's earth is put under tribute, you have to expect that you're going to face the same thing. So he talks about sincerity in our approach to God. But what if, what if we just had a little bit more? Wouldn't that make things a lot better? And Solomon begins to speak about that in chapter 5 and verse 10. He springboards into this consideration of those who pursue prosperity. How often have we thought, you know, if I just had a little bit more money than so many of my problems, so many of the issues that I'm facing, they'd get, they'd get a lot better. You know, my life would improve if I could just get that next raise, that next promotion, that new job, a little more overtime, whatever it happens to be that, that we think is going to make our lives much better. And that's a prevailing thought that we have around us, that a little more money makes things a whole lot better. And Solomon now begins to discuss that here in verse 10. Solomon looked around and he saw that the rich are never content. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. The more someone gets, the more they want. Lust can be fed, but never filled. And the feeding of those lusts leaves the spirit hungry and the heart empty. And the love of money grows in proportion to the amount of money possessed. As we feed that lust, it grows and it increases, but it remains hungry. It wants to be fed more and more. You think about a simple example where somebody says, you know, I want to make uh, $50,000 a year, 70 or 100, whatever the target is that somebody sets. If I could make that much money, then I'd be set. Solomon says, okay. That happens in verse 11. Goods increase. They've reached the target that they set for themselves. But it doesn't bring the satisfaction they thought. Because when the goods increase, they also increase that eat them. Person makes more money. Well, I can change my lifestyle now. I don't need to eat ramen noodles every day. I can eat better food. I can increase the amount of time that I go out to eat. I can drive a nicer car. I can wear nicer clothing. And before long, all the money is consumed. Nothing else to show for it. What do they have to show for it? Well, Solomon says in verse 11, What good is there to the owners thereof save the beholding of them with their eyes? I could see all this additional stuff that I have, but no additional money in the bank. Well, I guess my situation isn't a whole lot better. So now I need to make this much money. They set a new target, and this cycle continues. But what if, what if the solution is instead of adjusting your lifestyle, you achieve your target, but then you save the money, so you have fiscal discipline. So now he considers that individual. This person begins to stack up wealth in verses 12 and 13. Is that the answer? Having more discipline from a monetary standpoint. But then as they stack up more money, well, now they begin to worry about that money. What should I do with it? Where should I invest it? How's the stock market doing? Can I make payroll? How much more money do I need? And they begin to lose sleep over it. Meanwhile, the working man in verse 12, he works hard. He doesn't have a lot of money in the bank, but he has enough food to eat. He sleeps well at night. He seems to get by without all the stuff. But the rich man, Solomon says, he has a sore evil. 
An evil disease is what the Hebrew says. And it's this idea of being self-inflicted, to make oneself sick. And Solomon sees the impact of the pursuit of wealth on the individual that's going after it. The stress and the anxiety make him sick. It makes him distressed. And the rich man becomes impoverished because of his wealth. The rich man becomes poor because of the richness that he possesses. The very things that he thought to secure for himself, quality of life, longevity, those things suffer because of the pursuit of them. But despite all of this worry, all of this care about his money, it perishes with evil travail in verse 14. That means by being ill-employed, a bad investment, the stock market crashes, the business goes bankrupt. Have you ever experienced something like this of where you think, oh, I'm starting to get ahead, I'm starting to save some money. I know I have. And then all of a sudden the furnace dies, the water heater goes out, the money grows wings and flies away. And we realize, well, maybe I'm looking at things from the wrong perspective. This man sacrificed so much in his life so that he'd have a dynasty to pass on to his son. Sacrificed so much with his family, but now he has nothing to show for it. He has nothing to pass on to his son, is what we're told in verse 14. And the man himself in verse 15 dies. Nothing to show for it. All this heartache, all this worry. But he returns to the grave just as he came into this world, naked and empty. But even if he would have been able to sustain riches to the point of death, he can't take it with him, is what Solomon says. He can't take it with him. And Solomon calls this an evil disease. An evil disease is what Solomon says in verse 16. And it's not that he can't take it with him. The evil disease is that he spent his life laboring for the wind. The wind is a very interesting thing, isn't it? Because the wind can bring warmth and cold. It brings fragrances of budding flowers in the springtime, the smell of the leaves in the fall. But reach out and try to grasp hold of the wind. Try to retain it. It's a foolish image, isn't it? it slips through your fingers every time. Solomon says that's what pursuing prosperity in this life is like. It's like grabbing for the wind, something that's unattainable. It's only going to lead to frustration and anxiety. But how many people, how many of us, can unwittingly find ourselves engaged in this pursuit? Because we all know this to be the case, but unwittingly, our minds trick us, and we find that we're engaged in this rat race of humankind. Seeking after the next raise, the next purchase, the next thing, the next whatever it is. Thinking that it's going to bring fulfillment, but finding that it offers no solution. There is a better alternative to the pursuit of prosperity. Solomon identified in chapter 5 verses 1 through 9 that godliness is the solution to life's inequities. And now he's going to show that contentment is the solution to the pursuit of prosperity. Look at what he says in verses 18 to 20. Look at what he declares. Behold that which I have seen. This is a huge declaration that Solomon's coming to, a massive conclusion that he wants to share with us. Behold what I have seen. This is the better alternative. It's good and comely. Or it's better and it's beautiful for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days that God hath given him. For it is his portion. Comely is the same as beautiful that we saw back in chapter 3 and verse 11. So just as God makes everything beautiful in his time, so too God has given man one source of fulfillment in this life. And that is the tranquility that comes from understanding the limitations of mortal life and deriving contentment from the simple and ordinary things that he gives to us. That's it. Solomon says, behold what I have seen. Of all the things that Solomon had in life, all the possessions that we can read in, the 666 talents of gold that came in on a continual basis to Solomon, all the money, all the wealth, all the possessions, the things that he keys in on, food to eat, and the ability, the blessing to be able to enjoy it. 
And we think, well, here goes Solomon again, talking about the simple things of life. Haven't we already heard this in the book? But he's saying, behold what I have seen, like this is something new. But this is an exclamation, not necessarily of something new. But we could put a lot of exclamation points after this because Solomon's saying, I've gone through every single pathway in life looking for something different. But it all leads back to the same conclusion. The same conclusion is that the best thing that you can do, the best thing that you can have are the simple things and to appreciate them. It's not just that. It's a blessing that God gives you to actually be able to enjoy them. Having them is one thing, but the blessing to enjoy them is an additional thing, and to do it without wanting more. To do it without wanting more is what he says in verses 18 to 20, which is all summarized in one word, contentment. He's already established that those who love abundance will not be satisfied with increase, but now he's showing that those who love God will be content with enough. That those who love God will be content with enough. And those are words to live by, aren't they, brothers and sisters? He says in verse 20, For he shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. This doesn't mean that good things happen to good people all the time. But it means that in the face of trial and in the face of adversity, the righteous person, the person who is content, understands that God is at work in their lives. And if we would have kept reading in Romans 8 yesterday, we would have come to verse 28, which says that all things happen for good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Not some things, not most things, all things. And so those who are content with God's plan accept that in faith and move forward in faith knowing that God has a plan. And they're able to move forward, looking forward, because an attitude of contentment allows you to do that. An attitude of dissatisfaction does the opposite. It leads to a continual looking backward of why am I here? How did I get to this point? What went wrong? But contentment allows you to move forward in faith, to keep moving forward, regardless of what life puts in front of us. It sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Be thankful for God's simple blessings and rejoice in the opportunities that God gives us to enjoy those blessings. That this is the best thing that we can hope to gain from this life. That godliness with contentment is the best thing from this life. But is this life what it's all about? Well, no, it's not. So this is what Solomon's saying. And this floored me when I read it or when I thought about it. He's saying if you have food and drink, you've conquered this life. You've obtained everything that you can get from this life. So now that you have food and drink, go on to think about something important, and that's living with God. Don't get distracted by all the other stuff. I've been there. I've looked at it. I've gone down every single pathway. I've tread it. I've threshed it. I've explored it. There's nothing there. If you have food and drink, that enables you to move forward and focus on what's important, and that's living with God and being content. Now, I've made this summary slide, which basically breaks every rule of PowerPoint, but I did it for the purpose of showing what it is that Solomon identifies with the pursuit of prosperity versus godliness with contentment. He says the attitude behind the pursuit of prosperity is that they're not satisfied. Somebody is not happy, which is why they always want more. Chapter 5 and verse 10. This is what you receive from not being happy and always looking for more. Much sorrow, anger, trouble sleeping, nothing to show for it, no power to enjoy it, the stranger eats it, the appetite's not filled, and hurt. Here's the assessment. It's vanity, it's a sore evil, there's no profit, it's evil, there's nothing good, it's evil travail, it's laboring for the wind, it's an evil disease. It's not filled with good. But why? Why is the reason for that? Because their whole life is lived in darkness. They don't see the sun. They don't understand the purpose of this life is not about this life. And I put this in my Bible as well because it's a preponderance of evidence that Solomon is trying to use to convince us 
of something that we don't want to believe. But that's the truth. On the other side is the attitude of the godly with contentment. They enjoy the good of their labor, the simple things. They rejoice. They have joy. And like I said, it doesn't mean that good things happen all the time to those who are godly with contentment. It means that they view the trials in their life with the right perspective. What do they receive? His portion. Power to eat. And the assessment is that this is good. This is comely. This is beautiful. But why? Because God gives it. Because it's the gift of God. Because God answers their prayers. Because their life is focused on God. Solomon's treaded out. He's explored everything. And he's found that this life is not about this life. This is not the gospel of prosperity that we hear around us, of where God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be content with enough. God determines what is enough for each one of us. And Solomon says, food and clothing, food and raiment, food and drink, the daily necessities of life that enable you to focus on what's important, that's enough. And so in the first half of the book, Solomon has looked at it all. He's looked at personal endeavor and personal experience in our executive summary. All the things that he did. He looked at the consideration of time. This rule that locks down humanity. This rule of time that God has put over us. And he's seen that that points us back to God. He's looked at his observ observations of human nature and of human experience. Of life's inequities and how to conquer those things through godliness. He's taken a look at the pursuit of prosperity and the ultimate end of it. That contentment is the solution. And in each case, Solomon was bled back to the same exact conclusion. He's answered this question of the first half of the enigma of Ecclesiastes. What does man gain by all his toil in this life? And as an end in itself, this life yields nothing of profit. Whatever we can extract from this life is meant to focus us on our development for the future. And now he begins to answer this second question. As he's led to proclaim at the end of chapter 6, well, who knows then what is good for man? And he begins and continues to key on the need to enjoy the simple things with thankfulness, but to also pursue wisdom, faith, and godly fear. So where do we see this picked up in the New Testament? And your minds might already be going there. The words of Paul to a young man who had his whole life ahead of him. A young man with a lot of opportunity, a lot of skills, and a decision of where he would invest those skills. The decision that he had to make of what he was going to do. And that young man was Timothy. Look at the parallel here in the way that Paul picks up these words of Solomon. Do you think that these words were in his mind? 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Compare that to chapter 5, verses 18 to 20 of Ecclesiastes. Verse 7 of 1 Timothy 6, We brought nothing into this world, and it's certain that we can carry nothing out. Isn't that what Solomon says about the rich man? Of what he came into this world with, and what he'll leave this world with. Verse 8, Having food and raiment, let us be content. What is it that Solomon continues to key in on over and over and over again? And now in this case, in chapter 5, verses 18 to 19. But Timothy, if you decide to go down a different path, if you think that just a little bit more is going to make things a whole lot better, verse 9, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. How many negative things can Paul fit into this in one verse? <laughs> How many negative attributes did Solomon include in chapter 5 about the pursuit of prosperity in this life? Drowning men in perdition and destruction. That's terminal. That's the end. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after. How many times does Solomon call it evil? Six times in that chapter. He reiterates how evil it is to pursue things in this life. The result, Timothy, is that many people have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Chapter 5 and verse 17. All his days also he eateth in darkness, and he hath much sorrow and wrath with his sickness. 
Paul's advice to the young with their whole life ahead of them. Paul's advice to Timothy. So what is the advice to us, brothers and sisters? It also is found in Timothy. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. The choice is before us. God's provided us with a better alternative. Let's lay hold on eternal life.